this morning. We thank you, God, that you are a God that meets us, Lord, that you are a God who's present in our lives, Lord. You are holy, Lord. You are worthy of all the honor and the praise, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Can we just begin to worship the Lord this morning? In your own words, just tell him how much you love him.
the gift of speaking in tongues. This is not prophesying, but this is building up your inner man. I want to ask you to open your mouth and let that gift flow this morning. Shiro, Holy Spirit, we honor you in this place. God, we declare that you are in control of this room. God, we give you this room, God, for you to do what you want, God, in us and through us this morning. the Lord is doing something that something in the atmosphere of this place is beginning to shift as you open your mouth if you're not filled with the heavenly language you just open your mouth and you begin to sing praise to the Lord like the walls of Jericho as they fell when the people of Israel let out a shout I believe this morning as we open our mouth and we let something come out of our mouth let something bubble up from our spirit that the walls of Jericho in your life are going to begin to fall this
Lord, I thank you, Lord, that communion is not just something we do out of religion, uh, but God, it's something that we do out of remembrance. So in Matthew 25, Jesus sat down with his disciples and he broke bread and he drank wine before he was crucified, before he took the cross for us. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. He said, do this to remember what I've done for you. And I'm here to tell you this morning that whatever it is that you need, it can be found in the cross and the work of the cross. If you need healing, if you need deliverance, if you need salvation, if you need provision, it can be found under the work of the cross, the cross that Jesus took for us. And so right now, I just want to encourage you, whether it's your first time, whether you've been here so many times, I want to encourage you to close your eyes and pretend like you're talking to Jesus face to face. Jesus, we just remember what you've done for us. Jesus, I thank you for the cross that you bore, that your body was beaten, that your body was broken, Lord, for the blood that you shed so that I can be saved, God, so that I can have salvation, Lord God, so that I can have a heritage of the righteous from generation to generation, God. I thank you, Lord, that for what you've done in my life. When I was broken, God, when I was alone, when I was depressed, God, that you met me where I was that your blood was sufficient, God, that the sacrifice that you gave for me, Lord, was sufficient. Come on, just tell him thank you. It's an opportunity for gratitude this morning. That communion is an opportunity to give thanks to the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. Right now, I want you to take the, the bread that represents the body of Christ that was broken for us, and I want you to hold that bread up. situation, God, that your blood is sufficient for all of my needs. And I want you to say it out loud with your mouth, say, Jesus, I thank you for your blood that was shed for me. And you can go ahead and you can drink the
to Limitless Church. We are so happy to have each and every one of you here with us. Out of all the wonderful churches that you could be at this morning, we're so honored that you chose to come and worship and fellowship with us. So at this time, turn around, greet your neighbor. If there's someone that you haven't met before, go out of your way and make somebody feel welcome, all right? Welcome to Limitless Church. The vision of our church is to lead people to encounter Jesus and live out God's limitless purpose through daily partnership with the Holy Spirit. If this is your first time with us, we can't wait to meet you. Text the word Limitless VIP to 94000 so that we can get to know you. You can even fill out a connect card from the seat in front of you and return it to our VIP table on your way out for a free gift. Limitless Connect is your first step to joining and serving at Limitless Church, but it's about more than membership. It's about knowing God more, discipleship and community. For more info, text Limitless Connect to 94000. If you would like to take the next step in your faith journey, and be baptized, you can sign up by texting the word baptism to 210-880-0950. Here at Limitless Church, we honor God by giving our first and our best through tithes and offering. There are several ways you can give. Text GIVE7 to 94000 and click the link online at LimitlessChurchSA.com. You can give in person by using the boxes on your way out or send by mail. You can follow us on social media at Limitless Church SATX. You may also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Limitless Church SA to catch up on our latest series and sermons. If you have little ones ages 5 to 12, we would love for them to join our Limitless Kids upstairs. We also provide a nursery for world changers for and under. We would also like to remind you to silence all cell phones. The message will begin shortly. How's everybody doing this morning? Isn't it so good to be in God's house this morning? Come on somebody, Jesus is in the room today. Can we just lift our hands right where you're at? He is here. Lord, you are so good, God, in this place. God, your presence is so good. Come on, let's put our attention, let's put our focus on him today. God, he's so good in this place. Well, good morning, I am Pastor Stephen. If you're, uh, this is your first time here, welcome. I wanna welcome you. Um, can we give it up for everybody here who is new? I wanna give it up for everybody here who's new. Like uh, Pastor Trelawney just mentioned a moment ago, there are many awesome churches in the San Antonio area that you could be a part of. And we are so honored and privileged that you chose to be with us here at Limitless Church. Uh, if you would look at the seat in front of you, there's a connect card that you could uh, kindly just fill out. And we would love to connect with you. We would love to know that you came today. And we would love to meet you. If you wanna meet us in the lobby, you could bring it uh, to the table in the lobby for a free gift. Uh, the vision of Limitless Church is to lead people to encounter Jesus and live out God's limitless purpose through daily partnership with the Holy Spirit. And what this vision means, just how we, how we encounter the presence of Jesus just here a, mo a moment ago. Has anybody encountered the presence of Jesus? Amen. We do not want to just leave you with, with that and just to encounter him from Sunday to Sunday, but we really want to uh, encourage you and equip you to encounter Jesus on a daily basis. And I believe that the, the more and more you encounter him, the more and more he's going to speak to you. And let me tell you, when you learn to hear his voice, everything in your life begins to change. When you begin to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit through daily partner, partnering with him, it changes your life and you get to live the limitless purpose that he's called you to, amen? So one of the ways that we do this is through Limitless Connect. If you uh, would like to be a member here at Limitless Church or just 
kind of find some more information about the culture and the values, the vision of Limitless Church in more depth, you could text the word CONNECT uh, to our all-inclusive number that comes up on the screen. This is our all-inclusive number that you could text all of the keywords to. Uh, but text the word CONNECT. You could uh, go through it. You're going to watch a few short videos about our culture. You're going to take uh, some great assessments, spiritual gifts assessments, and an assessment how you connect with God. So here's, here's, the, here's the important thing. All of us, we, we don't all connect with God in the same way. We all connect with God differently. This is how God wired us. He, he, some of us could connect with God in the outdoors. Some of us could connect with God through solitude like I do behind closed doors. I don't want anybody around. Um, even right now, just encountering the God corporately with you, I was still connecting with him in solitude. I know how to connect with him anywhere that I'm at. Uh, but everyone uh, connects with him differently. So I encourage you, Find out how you connect with God. You're gonna have an appointment with one of our leaders here. They'll uh, FaceTime you. You can talk to them and uh, just go over your results. Uh, how many of you are ready for the word? I, I'm so, I was so blessed and I'm so blessed that the, the past couple of weeks, uh, man, they're just phenomenal words. Uh, can we give it up for Pastor Josh and, and Sister Vanessa, my sister Vanessa here. They just, um, they brought two phenomenal words. Uh, uh, messages back to back and we're just here at Limitless Church we're so blessed to have uh, we don't have to bring in special guests all the time we have people in-house that could just bring the Word of God in a powerful way amen um, if you want to turn if you would like my notes actually you could text the word notes to the number that comes up on the screen you could follow along with us I encourage you to do so we're gonna be today in John chapter 7 actually really John chapter 8 but I just want to read one verse from 7 uh, 53 So John uh, 7, 53, and then we're gonna go, it's, it goes straight to, into chapter um, eight. This is the, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And we're gonna start in verse, um, like I said, 53 of verse seven, it says, then the meeting broke up and everybody went home. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A, crown, a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Verse six says, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But check this out, Jesus stooped. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? He asked her, did even one of them condemn you? And here's her response. She says, no, she said, no, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I go and sin no more. The title of today's message and the topic I wanna to talk to you about today is encountering his eyes through shame, guilt, and religion. Let's bow our heads as we pray together over the word. Holy Spirit, we just, we acknowledge you right now because your presence is in this place. And we just say right now, we surrender to you, God. We surrender to you. Jesus, we're hungry for your word today. Come on, would you just make that real between you and him? Lift your hands and say, God, I surrender to you. I'm hungry for you. Just come and do whatever you wanna do today, Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us by the truth of your word today. I pray, Lord, as I speak your word today, that it will go forth and it will fall on good soil today, good ground in the hearts of your people God, let our hearts be good ground for your word today, Lord. Let our hearts be good soil for the seed of your word. I come against every distraction right now, every demonic distraction. There's no room for the enemy here. 
We only make room for you, Holy Spirit. We give you the entire room. Come and do whatever you want. We rebuke religion. We rebuke fear. We rebuke distraction in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray and everybody says amen. Amen. Can we give God one more hand of praise in this place? He is here. Come on, tell your neighbor, say he is here. This passage that I just wrote, read is probably one of the most controversial passages in the Bible. If you actually look, if you have a physical Bible, does anybody have a physical Bible in here with me? A few of us, yes. If you actually look at the reason I read chapter 7, verse 53, because right before it, uh, in chapter 7, verse 53, b- before it mentions this story, if you read what it says, it gives you a disclaimer. Your Bible gives you a disclaimer that it says, The most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include John, chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. It says that it does not include this story. And so this is one of the most ancient manuscripts. But there are two primary views why your Bible puts this here. And uh, one primary view is from an early church father by the name of St. Jerome. And what St. Jerome uh, indicates is that this um, was not in the original manuscript, but that... um, it was a faithful historical rendering of something that actually did happen. And so then it was added later on. And it's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, the other three gospels, but it was later added to John because John was written way after those gospels. Um, but however, this is not the only story that's in John that is not in the other three gospels. So something you know about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're considered synoptic gospels, which means they have a lot of the same stories in them. And they usually just talk about the third year of Jesus' ministry. Um, after Jesus gets baptized, then it goes to the thir- third year of his ministry. But the, the book of John is just an extraordinary book because John records all of these stories from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. See, so the, the, this story of, uh, of the woman caught in the act of adultery is not the only story that John mentions. He also mentions the wedding at Cana, where the first miracle of Jesus, where he turns water into wine. John 3, 16, that's when he, uh, when he has a conversation with Nicodemus. And the famous passage scripture, John 3, 16, right? We know that one. Uh, and John chapter 4 is when he actually has a, a conversation with a Samaritan woman. We're going to read that here in a moment as well. That's only in the book of John. Uh, John chapter 5, he... Uh, he heals a lame man. And then also uh, in John chapter, we read this in John chapter 8. Then John chapter 9, he heals a man uh, 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 who was blind from birth. And then also in John chapter 11 is when the raising of Lazarus. And none of those stories are in any of the other gospels except John. So there's another second primary view about the specific passage. And it's from um, uh, the, an early church father by the name of St. Augustine. Okay, and his belief is his claim is that this story was in the original manuscript, manuscript, but that it was removed for the fear of giving people a license to sin. They feared, the early church feared that this passage would give the church uh, uh, an excuse or a license to commit adultery, that there will be massive adultery in the church. So it was then removed and then also later put back in. And so this is what I believe is the problem, though, if that was the case. I believe that's the very problem. I believe the, the, the very reason that they took the passage out to begin with is the very reason that it should have been left in in the first place. And here's point number one that I want to get to. Point number one is religion will teach you how to love God without first teaching you how furiously loved you are by God. This is why we need this story. This story, and no, nobody at all disagrees that this, is, this story is, is uh, historically accurate. There's no question about that. It was just a matter of it was the Apostle John that wrote it. Um, but religion would try to teach you to love God without first teaching you how furiously loved you are by God. And so if we look at the context of the story, I always tell you all to look at the context, what happens before, what happens after. But right before this, this was the morning, Right before this was the festival of shelters or the feast of booths. And this is a huge celebration that just happened. I want you to think of it like a celebration that we celebrate here is Easter, right? Think of it like Easter meets the 4th of July. 
Everybody gets crazy for Fourth of July with fireworks, right? The sun is out, nobody's working, nobody's at school, you're just having a grand old time. And that's what was going on here at this time. The, it, it, everybody, had, it just finished the harvest as well. Everybody had money in their pocket. Everybody had just gotten paid. So it was just a great day for everyone. Then these Pharisees come in. They drag this woman at the feet of Jesus, trying to trap him, trying to test him. How many of you know we're not called to test the Lord? We're called to trust the Lord. And here these religious leaders are here trying to test him. And I want to look at this. Uh, first, I want to ask, um, what are they doing there? How do they catch her, right? Weren't they supposed to be at the temple? What were they doing? I, I, I believe, I don't think she was committing adultery at the temple. It's usually adultery is something more secretive, right? So, number one, how did they catch her? What were they doing there? Um, how did they know what was happening, right? And then another thing I want to I ask is, who's missing in the story? The man, the man is missing in the story. Bicycling is a solo sport. Swimming is a solo sport. Adultery is a team sport. The last I check, it takes two to tango, right? <laughs> so where is this man, right? Where is he? Um, I, I, it looked, to me, it seems like a setup, which is why I'm asking these questions. It seems like a setup. Did they hire this guy and then just tell him to leave? Say, hey, you're good to go. Your job is done. We're here to embarrass this woman and test and trap Jesus. And in order for us to really, truly understand the measure of mercy and love in this story, I believe we have to identify with the participants here. All right? So number one, there's the woman. The woman, you're guilty You've been caught, right? It's known by everybody. You did it, whatever it is, right? Then there's the man in the story. You're guilty. You did it, whatever it is. But nobody knows about it. Nobody seems to know about it. And then there's also a third. There's the religious leaders. The judgmental, fault-finding Pharisees that overlooked their own sins and overlooked their own faults and their own flaws. So those are the three people that we can identify with. You might be thinking, what about Jesus? Do I identify with him? No, not in this story, all right? <laughs> Nobody here identifies with Jesus in this story, okay? There's three you could pick. The, the woman, the man, or the religious hypocrites. Rock, paper, scissors, you pick, all right? So to me, this looks like, like a setup, um, but... Um, Again, religion would try to teach you to love God without first teaching you how furiously loved you are by God. For, religion would tell you to do this, do that. They'll teach you how to be holy without introducing you to the Holy One. Religion would try to make you be holy without setting up an encounter with the Holy One. This is why we're so intentional here with having encounters with Jesus. That's our vision, leading people to encounter Jesus, not encounter religion. Come on, somebody. Matthew 13, 44. I want to just show you how, how loved you are by God. I want to read this passage of scripture, which I've read many times here before, but I do want to read it. Matthew 13, 44. This is a, a parable of Jesus, and it's the shortest parable in the Bible. It's called a one-verse parable. And uh, we're going to start Matthew 13, verse 44. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. And this is one of the most misinterpreted parables in the Bible, I believe. A lot of people, the traditional understanding of this parable, a lot of people think that they understand the field being the world. But a lot of people think that the kingdom is the treasure and that you are the man and you give it all up for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the treasure. That's how many people understand this verse, but that's not, the, I believe, the real meaning of this verse. I believe here's the real meaning of this verse. 
I believe the field is the world, which all the other parables before this and after this say that. The field is the world, but Jesus is the man. And you are the treasure. And he gave up everything to buy you back. He bought the whole world because he loves the world. That's what John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He's so good and he's so completely fascinated with us. He's so completely fascinated with you. But here's the thing. See, the Pharisees didn't see this woman as treasure. They saw her as junk. The religious leaders came. They dragged her. They used her. They abused her. They embarrassed her. Right? But here, here's the thing. Jesus saw this woman as treasure. When he saw this woman, I could only imagine what Jesus was thinking. She's the reason why I came. She's the treasure that I was looking for. But see, religion didn't see her that way. Religion saw her as junk. See, because religious people, they actually don't like this understanding of this parable. Religious people like thinking that the kingdom is the treasure and we work hard and we strive and we give up everything for the sake of the kingdom because the religion likes to rely on its own works. Come on, somebody. Religion likes to rely on its own works, on its own performance, on its own striving. But I don't know about you, but I'm, I gave that up. I gave up striving. I gave up performance, religious performance. I gave up pressure. And let me tell you something. I feel like I've never in my life been more free more at peace, more at rest than ever before in the God's presence. See, this is the reason why I believe this, is, this parable is so because this woman wasn't looking for Jesus. She was not looking for Jesus. Are y'all understanding that? This woman was not looking for Jesus, but Jesus found her in the middle of her mess. He found her, his treasure in the middle of her mess. She was one of the many reasons why he came. And I want to read another passage here, just how furiously loved you are by God. This is such an awesome passage of scripture. If you want to check on your notes or turn in your Bibles to Psalms 139. And I do want to read the entire passage of scripture. It is 18 verses. And I was trying to pick and choose which verse I wanted to use in here. But I'm like, man, I'm going to read the entire thing. It's so powerful. Psalm 139 verse 1. It says, Oh Lord... You have examined my heart and know everything about me. I want you to know that he knows everything about you. He knows everything about you. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to understand. Too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. I thank God that even when I tried to backslide, he didn't let me. His grace didn't let me. His grace was too good to, man. <laughs> even darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. And you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. I love this part. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your worksmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. 
Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. That's so powerful. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Friends, let me tell you, your God is completely fascinated and mesmerized by you. He is completely fascinated and mesmerized by us. And I want to read another passage in, in Songs of Solomon 4.9. It says this, and this is the Songs of Solomon, if you read it, it's, it's a picture, a great picture of, of uh, Jesus, the groom, and us as the bride, the church. And it says, Psalms 4, verse 9, it says, You have captured my heart. This is the bridegroom speaking to his bride. You have captured my heart, my treasure. There's that word, my bride. You hold it hostage with just one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Church, he is furiously loved. You're furiously loved by him. I want to tell somebody that. Somebody needs to understand that. Because people have been trying to teach you to live right. People have been trying to teach you to be holy. And you've never encountered the Holy One. You'd never encountered true love before. But I'm telling you, this woman, this day, she encountered true love. She encountered true mercy. And she was never the same again. Point number two, sin will change your mind about who God is and who you are. And I want to read, and we'll continue in this passage in, in John chapter 8, verse 7 says this. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And what this is actually implying, if you study the Greek, it's implying that let the one that who's never sinned as so, as this woman, and it, it, it's not, all sins are not left out, but I believe he was specifically talking to these Pharisees. Let the one who's never sinned like this woman cast the first stone. And they may have never done it with their hands, but all of them did it with their heart. I don't trust anybody who says, oh, you know what? I've never done that in my heart. Because all of us have. All of us have sinned in our heart. And Jesus even says, he says, if you've even looked at a woman upon lust... In Matthew 5, he talks about that. You've already committed it in your heart. Come on, somebody. So all of these Pharisees had to leave one by one. Everyone in this group was a sinner, except Jesus. Everyone in this group was a sinner, but they all had distorted views of God and themselves. I want you all to see this, church. First, there were the Pharisees. They believed God to be a, they saw God as a narcissistic, judgmental, fault-finding God. Which is why they were narcissistic, fault-finding, and judgmental. The woman saw God as a distant, abandoning, and absent God. Which is why she was living in guilt, shame, and religion. And the other group that I didn't mention is the disciples. The disciples were here as well. And the disciples, they saw God as a God who was going to make wrong things right in the wrong way. We talked about this a couple weeks ago where, where Peter, uh, I'm sorry, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn up the people who didn't believe in Jesus, right? So these disciples, what they believed, they saw God as, okay, he's here to make things right, but even if it takes being the wrong way, we'll still do it. Kind of like most conservatives nowadays. Sorry, I, that just slipped out. I, did, I, I don't know. <laughs> right? You could be on the right side and have the wrong spirit. I saw, I saw this guy on Instagram that I follow, and I, I like him. I like his stuff. And he was saying awesome things, and he says a lot of things about Jesus. But then on his shirt, it said, let's go, Brandon. Many of you know what, knows what that means, right? If you don't know what that means, it means bad word to Joe Biden, okay? So he was wearing that. So when I saw this, I, and I'm thinking, okay, he says he's a Christian. He claims he's a Christian. 
But would Jesus actually wear a shirt like that? Would Jesus say bad word towards Herod? Come on. You could be on the right side and in the wrong spirit and be wrong. So that's what, that's what these disciples were. They saw God as a, a God who's coming to make uh, wrong things right, even if he had to do it in the wrong way. So I want y'all to see this, though. Um, I want to make this point. I want y'all to get this, church. You can't be more righteous than you are right now if you're a believer in Jesus. You cannot be, become more righteous than you are right now. It's either you're righteous or you're filthy rags. Are you understanding that? <laughs> it's either you're righteous or you're not. You can't be any more righteous than you are right now if you're a believer in Jesus. Now, can you grow in righteous living? Yes, absolutely. I, I, this, past, um, this past week, I'm going to tell you all a story. Well, actually, a couple of years ago, I started a YouTube channel for my kids. Ezra and Addie, they just want, they wanted to do a toy review, so I started a YouTube channel for them. I recorded them. I edited it. It was pretty cool. And, um, but just this past uh, week on our way to school in the morning, uh, I heard my kids discussing in the back what they wanted to be when they grew up. And Ezra was saying, he's like, I want to be a YouTuber when I grow up. And I, and I was like, wait, did I hear that right? I was like, you want to be a YouTuber, Ezra? He's like, yeah. He's like, well, because many of y'all know that when we're younger, we wanted to be Firefighters, right? Uh, astronauts. Come on, y'all know. Police officers, doctors. Now the kids nowadays want to be YouTubers, right? <laughs> so he was saying, I, I said, did I hear you right? You want to be a YouTuber? He, says, he said, well, actually, I'm already a YouTuber. But I also want to be a YouTuber when I get older, too. And I was like, man, I love that. I love that. He's talking about his video from two years ago. He's, he's a YouTuber. They only done one video, and that was two years ago. But I thought about it, and God spoke to me something. I was like, man, I love that. And that's how most Christians, should, most Christ followers should live now. Is that, you know what? I'm going to be righteous one day, but I'm righteous right now too. I'm righteous right now because I believe in Jesus. Because let me tell you, the God I serve, the God who knew no sin became sin so that I can become the righteousness of God, is what the scriptures say. So it's either you believe that or you don't. It's all, it's all in your belief. It's all in your identity. And all three of these categories, the Pharisees, the woman, and the disciples, all had a distorted view of who God was and who they were. Hebrews 10, verse 12, it says it this way. It says, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. I'm going to actually come to that part at the end of this message. Verse 13, it says, there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. Now watch this verse, church. Verse 14, for by that one offering, he forever made perfect. He forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Are y'all seeing that? He already made you perfect. He already made you righteous, though we are being made holy, though we are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. But sin distorts how you view God and how you view yourself. And point number three is his holiness will not keep him from getting in your dirt. Verse six of John chapter eight, it says this. It says, they were trying to trap him, saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped. I love that. He stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer. Religion kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again. And he doesn't address them. But he does say this. He doesn't address their accusations. He says, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again. See, he not only stooped down to the dirt physically but he stooped down and met her in the most dirty circumstance of her life. He met this woman in the most dirty circumstance of her life. And the law of Moses said to stone her. And the religious leaders could have been like, it's right here, Jesus. I have the proof. 
It's in black and white. But no, let me tell you something. The scripture is also in red too. The words of Jesus. See, because Jesus is not submitted to our interpretation of the scripture. See, the scripture, our interpretation has to be submitted to the person of Jesus. And Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. And he says, let the one who's never sinned cast the first stone. And this is so powerful because Jesus, the only one who was qualified to throw that stone, didn't throw the stone, but he stooped. His holiness did not keep him from getting in her dirt, but religion would have never guessed that he would stoop. Religion never guesses that he would stoop. And I want, to che- I, want, I want you to see this. I want you to check this out. Luke chapter 7, this is a, a passage of um, Jesus. I'm sorry. Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's home, and the woman uh, with, with the alabaster jar came in at Jesus' feet and worshipped him. But Luke chapter 7 Come on, are you receiving something this morning or this afternoon? Luke 7, verse 37, it says, When a certain immoral woman, kind of sounds like this other woman we're talking about, from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet. This sounds like a woman who is grateful and thankful for the mercy and grace of Jesus. And she kept putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. I'm telling you people, religion never guesses that he will stoop. Religion always thinks he's going to judge rather than show mercy. But I want to tell you something here today. I am so thankful for religion. I'm thankful for the seasons of striving. I'm thankful for the seasons of religious performance. I'm thankful for the seasons of hypocrisy. I'm thankful for the seasons of pressure because just like this woman, religion ushered me into meeting the real Jesus. Religion ushered me into meeting the real Jesus. See, religion fully anticipated that when I got to Jesus, I'd find judgment. But what I found was mercy. What I found was mercy. And while religious men wanted to swing, the creator of the universe wanted to stoop. The redemptive God of the universe wanted to stoop. See, it might have seemed like Jesus was handling this the wrong way. And I'm telling you, religion religion does not like what I'm saying right now. I'm telling you, it does not. (laughs) And I used to be this way. I used to be this way. I used to think, just like why they took this passage out originally from the Bible, I used to think that, yes, it's going to give people a license to sin. And I used to think that way. But let me tell you something. All it led was to striving and more striving, more pressure, more mess ups because I didn't know who I was, because I didn't actually truly encounter true mercy and true love. Religion hates this message. And it it might seem like Jesus is handling this situation the wrong way, but I'm telling you, Jesus didn't preach the gospel to her. Jesus demonstrated the gospel to her. That was better than y'all guys thought, I I think so. (laughs) That was really good. He was demonstrating the gospel here in this passage. He wasn't preaching to her. He was showing it to her. And Jesus didn't excuse her sin, but he was about to pay for her sin. He was about to pay for the sins, her sins and the sins of the world. And Jesus didn't minister a gospel of separation. He didn't say, you're separated from me. Now you have to receive me. No, he ministered a gospel of reconciliation not separation. See, in every true, rep- uh, every true presentation of grace, it should probably pose the question right after, should we then go on sinning? This is what Paul had to address. He, he addressed it many times. He says, he says, okay, hey, does this mean that you could go on sinning? He says, of course not. He's saying, of course not. But let me tell you, every true demonstration of grace 
it leaves the, re- the religious critics silent. One by one, the Bible says that they, they walked off, starting from the oldest to the youngest. What that represents is the highest form of religion has to leave, even all the way down to the lowest form of religion has to leave. Because it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not fear. It's not you better believe or this is going to happen to you. Come on, somebody. The scriptures say that perfect love cast out all fear. I don't have to fear judgment when I'm in Christ Jesus because I have his love. Romans 2 verse 4, it says this. It says, or do you disregard the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? I want to tell you something, people of God, how can I want to go back to a lifestyle of sin when the only person who was qualified to judge me and condemn me didn't swing, but he stooped. And he didn't judge me, but he had mercy on me. And he didn't condemn me, but he loved me. How could I want to go back after that? See, his kindness, grace, grace is the definition of grace is undeserved kindness. It's the undeserved, unearned, unmerited kindness. A lot of people get that mixed up. They say grace is power. I'll talk about that here in a moment. It gives us power, but it is kindness. In Psalm 68, verse 19, I love this passage. I was reading this in my daily readings a few months ago, and I had to jot it down, and I was like, you know what, I've never read this before, but I want to read it here to you today. Psalm 68, verse 19, it says, Praise the Lord, praise God our Savior, for each day he carries us in his arms. Come on, some of you might think that you're the one that's doing it, but it's because he's carrying you in his arms. It's only because of his grace that you're still moving forward direction. I, I saw this, this story on Instagram, and I thought it was very, very cool. It was a very cool story. Uh, it was a story of this, 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 uh, this Christ follower, this man, where he had a vision of Jesus, of him and Jesus on a beach. And uh, in his vision, he saw two sets of footprints walking on the beach, and that Jesus began to show him his entire life on this beach. And so the beginning part of this man's life, he saw two sets of footprints, which were his footprints and Jesus's footprints. But when his vision went on, he saw the end of his life. And at the end of his life, he only saw one set of footprints. And he was mad at God. He said, God, what, what was going on? Why is there only one set of footprints? Why did you leave me, Jesus? And Jesus said, no, those were not your footprints. Those were my footprints and I was holding you, and I was carrying you the whole time. Let me tell you something, people of God, it's not because of our works, it's only because of his grace. Can we give him some praise? Can we give him some worship? On your worst days, he's carrying you, and on your best days, he's carrying you. Verse 10, I wanna, I wanna go now move on to John chapter eight again. Verse 10, watch what it says here. It says, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And we talked about that. Their religion was gone. And then she said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is very, very interesting passage and very powerful passage, a very powerful verse. He says, go and sin no more. Other translations say, now go and leave leave your life of sin. And I wanna tell you this, when he said this, this was not a command. He didn't say, now go, and you gotta be more disciplined. He didn't say, go, and you gotta start reading my word. He said, go, and sin no more. It was empowerment. If you look and study the Greek in here, it was not a command, it was empowerment. He's saying, now from this encounter that you've had with my eyes, you now, have the, you now have the permission to leave your life of sin. You now have the power to leave your life of sin, to get up and walk, to get up and move forward. It was empowerment. 
Now here's what grace does. Grace gives us power. And his mercy gives us permission. His mercy gives us permission to leave the old and his grace gives us the power to embrace the new. That was better than you guys thought. His mercy gives us the permission to leave the old and his grace gives us the power to embrace the new. And here's point number four. And the, my, my last and final point is the answer is in his eyes. The answer is in his eyes. Revelation 2, verse 18. This is Jesus speaking in the book of Revelation to the apostle John in a vision. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the son of God whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. Revelation, verse 19, I'm sorry, chapter 19, verse 11 says, then I saw heaven opened and a white, horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. I'm telling you, people of God, the answer is in his eyes of fire. The answer to all of your problems, all of your sins, all of your worries, all of your concerns, the answer is in his eyes. See, I'm not concerned about messing up, church. I'm not concerned about messing up my relationship with Jesus. The only thing I'm concerned about is taking it for granted. This is why we emphasize daily encounters with him every single day. Because I don't ever want to think that I could do this on my own without encountering his eyes. I don't ever want to trust in my own righteousness or my own strength or trust in what I'm doing for God. I only want to trust in what he did for me. We have to daily encounter him. If I can just see his eyes, I know he is where my peace comes from. If I can just see his eyes, I know he is where my joy comes from. If I can just see his eyes, I know he is where my love comes from. If I can just see his eyes, I know he is where my deliverance comes from. He is where my freedom comes from. He is where my courage comes from. If I could just see his eyes. Another thing is we have to be thankful and grateful every single day. Do not take it for granted. Psalms 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and come, go into his courts with praise. We have to have a heart of thankfulness, a heart of gratitude, thanking him for his mercy, thanking him for his grace every single day. And at this time, I, I wanna invite the keys, you could come up, but I, I do wanna show you these, these last few stories. I'm not quite done, but I, I'm here on my last point. I wanna tell you, church, never stop being amazed by his grace and never stop being fascinated by his mercy. Don't take it for granted. And I want to show you four different people in the Bible who encountered his eyes. And I'm going to go through them very quickly, but four different people that encountered his eyes. The first person I want to bring up is the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. And if you know the, the story of this is the woman at the well, and she, she was uh, drawing water from the well, and Jesus came up to this woman and said, can you please give me a drink? And then she gives him a drink and he says, if any, uh, he, that's when he talks about himself. He says, anyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. And this woman is saying, hey, please give me this, this water you're talking about. And then he identifies that she has five husbands and that the, the, the man that, that she's living with is not even her husband. He, he identifies this in her life. And then, um, and then he tells her, and then she, she's religious about it and she brings in her religion. And the Samaritan woman says, hey, uh, why is it that y'all worship over there? We worship on this mountain, y'all worship on that mountain. And Jesus tells her, y'all don't even know who the one you're worshiping. Y'all don't, don't know very little about the one you're worshiping. And 
he, he, he goes and has this conversation with her. But I want to pick up in John 4, verse 25. Watch this. Watch what she does after her encounter with his eyes. It says in John chapter 4, verse 25, it says, The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Uh, Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well. Watch this. And she ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see. A man who told me everything I ever did, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. That's so powerful because, see, look, faith comes by hearing, right? But I want you all to see this. Transformation happens by encountering. See, she said, you had to come see him for yourself. She said, you you could hear what I'm saying. You could hear it. You could have faith to an extent, but it's only gonna get you so far. You had to come and see for yourself this man that I'm talking about. You have to encounter him for yourself. You have to look into his eyes like I looked into his eyes. And what she's saying, she's saying, come and see a man who knew everything I ever did. And I want, I want, you, to, I want you to see what this is actually meaning here. She, sell, she tells the village, she says, come and see a man who knew everything I ever did and still loves me. Come and see a man who knows everything it, there is to know about me and still loves me and still accepts me. Come and see him for yourself. And see people, the people came, it says they came streaming to come see him for himself. I wanna tell you something, church, if you're gonna make a difference, if we're gonna make a difference, people don't need to hear how bad they are. People need to hear how good he is. So that they can come and encounter him for themselves. So that they can come and be transformed for themselves. But see, too many many times the church wants to fight and argue over things, which we, of course, we know are true, right? And you could just kiss goodbye, ever winning them to Jesus. Come on, are y'all receiving something? Come and see, come and see, come and see. And see, and this woman experienced true love and she would never settle for a lesser love again because she encountered his eyes. This woman would never settle for a lesser love again. The second person I wanna, I wanna bring up to you is the man who was born blind. And this is in John uh, chapter nine. And I actually wanted to read the whole passage to you, but I don't have time to read it. But this man who was born blind, he um, was, was actually having a conversation with the Pharisees, with these religious leaders. And I, I do wanna pick up from here in John chapter nine, I was gonna read verse 18, but it's in your notes. I'm gonna skip down all the way to verse 23. And it says, that's why they said he is old enough, ask him. So he was asking, the Pharisees were asking his parents, was he really blind? They didn't believe it. They're like, was he really blind? And his parents are like, hey, he's old enough, go ask him. Verse 24 says, for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus is a sinner. And watch his response. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied. But what I do know is that I was blind and now I can see. That's what I know. And I wanna tell you something, church, people might come and ask you, well, what about this? What about that? What about the dinosaurs? What about all of this and that? And some of you, all you're gonna have to say is, I don't know about all of that. But what I do know is that I once was blind and now I can see. I can see, I can finally see the one who sees me. And then the, the last person that I wanna bring up who encountered his eyes was Stephen. Stephen was, um, it's a great name by the way. Uh, Stephen in the, in the book of Acts, uh, he has, it, it's when he's getting martyred, he's the first martyr for Christ. And he, um, it's, it's, this is so powerful, I wanna read it to you. Acts chapter six, verse 15, the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were about to stone him 
for believing in Jesus. And watch, I wanna read uh, Acts 6, 15 first, and then we're gonna jump to uh, Acts 7. But Acts 6, 15, it says, at this point, so let me give you more context. Stephen was about to just school these religious leaders in the Bible. He started with Abraham. He went all the way down and he explained the scriptures to them that they all pointed to Jesus. And he schooled, he schooled these religious teachers and teachers of religious law. So at, after this, it says, uh, at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Man, that is so powerful right there. That's so powerful. Now the next passage uh, in Acts chapter seven, verse 54, it says the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Now that's interesting because we just met, uh, read a moment ago that Jesus sat in the place at God's right hand. And here we see that Jesus was standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. And watch, I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. Verse 56, and he told them, look and see the heavens uh, opened and the son of man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They did not wanna hear it. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Here we have Stephen with his face shining like the sun and he repeats the same words that Jesus did when he was being crucified. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Don't count this sin against them. And Jesus, the son of man is standing at this time. And here's what I believe. I believe he was standing because I believe Jesus, I wanna say this really quick. I know a lot of people think that the rapture is gonna happen soon. It could, it could, could not or they, they, they believe in the second coming of Christ, it's gonna happen soon. But I wanna tell you something. I believe when Jesus looked at Stephen, he saw himself. He saw Stephen and Stephen looked so much like Jesus that Jesus was like, all right, that's, I'm coming for my boy. I'm coming for him. And I believe that one day when we're, we look more like Jesus, our faces are gonna shine right? When we act more like Jesus, we stop fighting with people. We stop judging people and we look like Jesus. I believe one day this, this, this world is going to look like the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is going to look down at us and say, all right, that's the kingdom I've been waiting for. Now I'm coming back home. I'm coming. But we're not there yet, guys. We are not there, but we're going to get there soon. And I believe there's a revival happening there's a revival stirring up. And I wanna tell you what revival, what I believe it all comes down to. Revival is, all it is is orchestrating encounters with his eyes. It's a place, it's a people orchestrating encounters with the eyes of fire, with the eyes of Jesus. And as I close out, this woman caught in adultery, Jesus wrote in the dirt. He wrote in the dirt, and there's many speculations, many messages about what he wrote in the dirt. Many people think that he was writing the sins of the Pharisees and saying stuff like that. I don't believe that was so. A lot of people think different things of what he was writing, but here's the thing. I don't believe what he was writing with his finger was the important thing of the story. I believe what he was writing with his eyes was the important part of this story. He was writing the story of a broken, shameful, guilty religious woman who was just receiving the mercy and love of God. That's what he was doing. So, so he was writing, he was in the dirt, not for any other reason, but that's because that's where her eyes were. He's like, if I could just get a glance, if she could just look into my eyes, I know everything would change. She would forget about everything that's going on around her. I wanna tell you church, one encounter with his eyes changes everything. 
And this world is in desperate need of a generation who has encountered the eyes of Jesus. Can we bow our heads at this time and close our eyes? And the only reason we say to do that is just to eliminate distraction. Come on, can we put our attention on him? Can we put our attention on him? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just speak to him in your own words. This is your time to respond. This is your time to respond to him. Come on, don't worry about what's gonna happen next. Don't worry about what's gonna happen next. This is an encounter with you and the one who has eyes as fire. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, show us your eyes, Lord. Come on, some of you, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you right now. I do wanna give this invitation. If there's anybody here under the sound of my voice, that you heard this message, you hear what is going on, you heard about Jesus, and you're saying, you know what, Stephen, I need, I need that Jesus you're talking about. I've encountered religion. I've encountered God, a so-called God. But this Jesus you're talking about, I need him and I need him now. If there's anybody in here that wants to say, Stephen, can you include me in this prayer that you're about to pray? If that's you, can you lift your hand very high and say, I wanna receive Jesus. I wanna receive Jesus. I see your hand back there. I see your hand back there. I see your hand back there. I see your hand right there. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Amen. You can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. Praise God. Is there anybody else? I need Jesus. I need him desperately. Come on, we gotta be desperate for him, church. We gotta be desperate for him. I need Jesus. I see your hand, I see your hand. Come on, let's pray this prayer because he's in the room. And I wanna tell you, this woman who was caught in adultery, she didn't repeat a prayer, but she encountered mercy. I'm telling you, it's all about encountering his mercy, all about encountering true love. So I just wanna guide you through this prayer as a starting place. So let's just all say, Lord Jesus, say, Lord, I need you. Say, Jesus, say, I am desperate for you. And I ask you today, Jesus, into my life, I give you my sin. I give you my heart. Fill me today, Jesus, with your love, with your mercy, with your grace. Come on, let it be real between you and him. Let it be real between you and him today, church. Come on, he's in the room, he's in the room, he's in the room. Let's worship him. Come on, let's worship him. Let's stand up to our feet. Come on, he's, let, let's worship him. I, wa I wanna, if anybody here needs to respond to Jesus here today, I believe he's, he's tugging on your heart. Come on, he's, he's speaking to you. I want you to respond in any way that he calls you to respond. Come on, close your eyes. And it may be coming to this altar and just kneeling up here. I felt earlier in worship, I just had to kneel before you, God. So if, however you feel led to respond, would you just respond to him at this time as we worship? Jesus, show us your eyes, Lord. Show us your eyes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We want to see you, God. We need you, Jesus. We need you. We need you. Thank you, Jesus. He's so deserving. He's so deserving. He's so deserving. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Come on, church. Jesus is completely fascin fascinated and mesmerized by you. I'm telling you, he wants you. He wants us more than we want him. So I pray Holy Spirit over your people here today, God. I pray over your church, God, that you would just rise up within them a passion. Lord, a passion for Jesus. I thank you that today, Lord, you're op you have opened eyes. You have opened ears, God. You have opened hearts. God, you have deposited your word today, Lord, that people may see Jesus, God. Come on, lift your hand, surrender to him. Come on, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, can you just stir up your spirit? And this is not prophesying in tongues. This is just our heavenly language, building up yourself. Jude 120 says, build yourself up in the Holy Spirit. Can you just pray in the Holy Spirit, stir yourself up, church? Come on, we need a, God is raising up a church who prays, who is desperate for him, who's hungry for him. Come on, church. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, he's touching some of your hearts. He's touching some of your hearts. This is why we came, church. We didn't come just to check it off of our list. We came to encounter the ones with eyes of fire. Now very quickly, if we could just get our prayer team, all of those who are part of our prayer team, if you could just make your way up here and we're just gonna stay in this atmosphere of worship. And if there's anybody who needs prayer for any reason, I want you to come up to one of these, uh, these prayer team members and receive prayer. It could be prayer for anything, prayer for yourself, prayer for your spouse, prayer for your marriage, prayer for your children. We all need prayer. So can we get our prayer team up here very quickly?
Come on, can we sing that here this morning? Can we sing that? Let your kingdom come, Lord God. Let your kingdom come to this earth. Let your will be done as it is in heaven, God. Come on, just begin to pray his kingdom down. Come, Lord Jesus. Let your kingdom come to our hearts today, God. Come and rule and reign, Jesus, in our hearts. Come on, some of you, I feel like you need to allow Jesus, King Jesus, to rule and reign in your life. I believe there's people in here that believe in Jesus, but he does not rule and does not reign in your life. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, come and rule and reign, Lord. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come on, some of us have been waiting on a work, on a move of God, and it's already here. He's already did the work. It's already happening, and we have to jump in. We have to jump in. Thank you, Jesus.
in us and in live in this church and in the city of San Antonio, God, and in America, God. I thank you for the revival that you're bringing, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would let us be a part of what you're doing. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Come on, y'all, give it up for the Lord. Wasn't that so good? Well, before we leave today, I have a few closing announcements. The first announcement that I have is that community groups are back. They're in session. So if you are new to our church, if you are not connected and you are looking for a way to be connected, to have community, to have fellowship, I want you to go ahead and um, text, connect to the member that's on the screen behind me. Also our fall fest. So every year we do a fall fest. So instead of Halloween, we do Fall Fest here at the church. And so this year, our Fall Fest is going to be November 2nd from 3 to 7 p.m. So if you are interested in helping and serving, we need a lot of help. It's a, a, an awesome event that happens every year, but it requires a lot of help. So if you're interested in serving, um, please let us know, and we would really appreciate that. Also, worship auditions are going to be extended all this month. So if you're interested in learning an instrument, are using your gift of singing for the Lord, you can go ahead and talk to either Aaron or Palms right here through direct message on the Instagram. And then last but not least, giving. If you are here and you felt led to give either your tithe or an offering, you can do so either online by, by texting our number that's on the screen or in person in our giving boxes at the back of the sanctuary. And then lastly, if you have kids in nursery or children's church, please don't forget to pick them up. And then thank you so much for coming and being a part. I'm going to pray us out before we leave. I'm going to speak a blessing. Lord God, I just thank you for every person that's here with us this morning, God. And I just speak blessing over them as they go into their week, God. I pray, Lord, that they would just encounter you daily, Lord, in this week. That you would speak to them, God. And that their hearts would be ready to receive from you. And I just speak blessing and favor on them. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Well, thank you guys for being a part of our service this morning. And we just ask that you would come. We hopefully we see you next.